So our overall goal today is to solve systems of linear differential equations, first order. Now, we did a version of this several weeks ago using the elimination, and you guys absolutely loved that, right? Yeah, no, it wasn't all that fun. It was really tedious from a notation standpoint. There was nothing wrong with it. It's just, it's very limited because it really was only effective if it was two equations, right? What happens if it was three or more? You're, you really don't want to use elimination in that sense. The, the, the addition method slash elimination method is only for two equations and two variables, right? The substitution method that goes side by side was two variables and two equations. Even Kramer's rule, you don't really want to do with more than two equations and two variables. It's just too long. After that, you start using a matrix to solve systems of equations. So in this sense, if it's a system of differential equations, the elimination method we learned is absolutely correct, as long as there's only two. What if there's more than two? Then it's not efficient at all, if it's even possible. Now you really have to use the matrix approach, the eigenvalue, eigenvector approach. So I'm going to start with the problem that I want to do today. Okay. Uh, I'm going to use T. Um, I don't remember what the problem was there. Taking the problem out of the book here. Um, <laughs> this pen feels very inky. Now I'm going to I'm going to use this form. Sometimes, uh, like this author will use dy dt and dx dt, which is totally okay. The problem is we're going to introduce vectors into the process, vectors as column matrices, and we need to give the vectors a name. If I'm using both x and y in the problem, then I have to come up with another name for the vectors. And what the author's doing, he's using x and y, and then just using a different form of an x for the vector. It, it starts getting confusing because you were reusing the same letter of the alphabet. Now, you can distinguish what's going on. So what I want to do is I'll use y's for my variables and I'll use x's for my vectors so there's just no way there will be any confusion, right? When you see an x, it'll be a vector. When you see, you know, from that standpoint in terms of things like solutions. So the first goal here is to write this as a matrix equation. Now I'm going to remind you, this goes back to, in my linear algebra class, this would be literally day three of the semester. So let's say I have the following. I have, I'm going to keep it simple. I've got, you know, 2x1 plus 3x2 minus 4x3 equals 5. I've got 6x1 minus 9x2 plus x3 equals negative 1. And I've got 8x1 uh, plus x2 minus 5x3 equals 0. I want to write this as a matrix equation. So the first thing was to identify the coefficient matrix which we usually will just go ahead and call A. Now, I'm not going to go into all the row operations and all that. I just want to remind you what you know. And then we're going to identify the column matrix of variables. And as you know, a column matrix is a vector. They are exactly the same thing. When do you use one versus the other? It's a context thing. If I'm doing matrix multiplication, it's easier if I write it as a column matrix than if I write it as a vector that looks horizontal. It, it doesn't feel the same. But they're interchangeable parts. They are exactly the same thing because we can show it from an algebraic standpoint, plus they're isomorphic. Right? That's all I need to know. So that guy. And then the last one we'll call the column matrix of constants. Okay? And if I write this now as a matrix equation without rewriting, what do I have? A, X equals B. Now this you did early on. Now why is this such a powerful way of doing things? Well, for one is, if, if this has a unique solution, one of the ways I can find it is by finding the inverse of the matrix A and then multiplying. That's one way. I can do row operations. Whether it has a unique solution or a parameterized solution, I can still do row operations. I have a bunch of possible options. But this is how I write it as a matrix product, right? This is early on easy stuff. I want to write this as a matrix product. So in other words, I want to use the exact same major idea, which means I'm going to have vectors. So I'm going to write it like this. dy1 dt, dy2 dt, 
equals 4 negative 5, 2 negative 3 times y1, y2. And then quick check, matrix multiplication. It would be this plus this, that would be my first entry. This plus this, that would be my second entry. And then I equate the two, I get this back again. And that's how you know you did it right. Now I need to name these guys. So for lack of a better name, we'll, again, we'll call this one A, we'll call this one Y bar. And a lot of what people will do, we'll call it the Y prime bar. Because it's, it's too much to write using derivative notation. There's, there's, there's no way I'm gonna misconstrue this guy. All right, so that was easy enough. What is the goal? The goal is to write the solution for this. Here, the goal was similar. You know, I want to write what those guys are. Here, I want to figure out what are those guys. Those guys are going to be functions, by the way. They're not going to be numbers. If they were numbers, if the y's were numbers, then wouldn't the derivatives all be zeros? So I know they're functions. Likely, what kind of functions are they, do you think? Exponential. Linear. Probably exponential, because this is first order linear. Probably going to be exponential. I wouldn't see sines and cosines unless it was second order, would I? Maybe think about it. Oh, yeah, yeah, OK. So that part, we kind of have an idea what the answer is going to look like. It doesn't help us find it yet. So this is writing it in, in this form, OK? So now, how do I find it? Well, this is where eigenvalues and eigenvectors will come in. In my linear class, the last day of real matrices, we do four days, the last day we solve this kind of problem, and I show how to use eigenvalues and eigenvectors, but it's one lecture. In fact, it's not the only thing we do at that lecture. Maybe it's two-thirds of that lecture. So from that standpoint, we don't make it a big deal. We just show it's one of the applications of eigenvalues and eigenvectors. There are many others that are infinitely more important, okay, solving stochastic matrices, different things, stuff that I like to work on. But in this class, this now becomes a major application, so we need to go just a little bit deeper, a little bit further, if nothing else, to remind us what was possible. So that means I need to be able to find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So that's what I want to review next. I know you, well, if you're sitting here, you should have. How if I put it that way? Who was in my 254 class? Or Isaiah Doink? Oh, is it just three of you? When did I teach it last? Oh, like a year ago? I did spring last year. Oh, has it been that long? <laughs> I didn't do it last semester. God, this is awful. I don't even remember. I didn't do it last semester, apparently. Okay. So not that many of you, but the thing is, you've done it. Do you remember it right now at this moment? No, yeah. Probably not. <laughs> How many had linear last semester? Do you remember everything about it right now at this moment? Probably not. But we're in May. You probably did this November, early December. Yeah, I, I don't expect you. You know, we're going to review it. So... This is our goal is to solve this problem. We can't start by solving this problem unless we remember all the previous stuff. So I'm going to spend a few minutes reviewing the previous stuff, how to actually solve the problem. So an eigenvalue, eigenvector problem looks something like this. I have an n by n matrix A has to be square. It has to be square. n by n matrix A, and when I multiply it by the column matrix, as you know, I multiplied a 2 by 2 times a 2 by 1, and I got a 2 by 1. So you guys remember the, how, to, how to link them together. So this is n by n, this is n by 1, so what's the result? An n by 1. Also n by 1, and our goal is to write this as a scalar multiple of the original x. If I can do this, lambda is called the eigenvalue, but the more important one is x, and that's called the eigenvector. Every square matrix, as an absolute mathematical statement, every square matrix has at least one eigenvalue, and every eigenvalue has at least one associated eigenvector. Now, the eigenvector, there, every multiple of that eigenvector is still an eigenvector. So what we're looking for is a, is a basis vector. In other words, we, we parameterize the vector, and then we say, let's just take the basis of that eigenspace. I know some of the vocab you're going, okay, I can't remember what those words mean. I'm going to walk you through it and you're going to go, okay. In the textbook, the author says, no, choose values. No. Absolutely, that's incorrect. Because if you're allowed to choose values, you should always choose zeros. zeros. <laughs> and then you won't get anything. <laughs> no, you're not choosing values. In fact, it's not even like choosing values. It is so far from choosing values that it's absurd. And it, 
that's one of the first things that tells me, I'm sorry, but the author really doesn't have any idea what he's talking about. He just borrowed from some other really bad source. You can't choose values. There's an infinite number of things. You want to write your answers at multiple of those things and then take the basis. Okay, so how the heck do you solve this? Well, if I wrote it like this, what would that equal? Zero. Would it equal the number zero? No. The vector. Yeah. Equal the vector zero. Good. <laughs> it can't equal the number because they're those are column matrices. Mm -hmm. Oh, so then let's just factor because matrix multiplication, although not commutative, is associative and it is distributive. So if I simply factor this out, that'll be a piece of cake, right? <laughs> Uh-oh, I'm winking with my left eye. Is there anything wrong with this statement you mathematically? Need an I absolutely well, an that's a n by n matrix. That's a scalar. I can't subtract a scalar from the matrix. There's no meaning. Shoot, we're dead in the water. No, I I gotta go back a step. What, what do I need to do, Mateo? Multiply. So. Sorry, I raised There we go. Will this be the same thing? The n by n identity matrix times x will still be x. I know that. But now that will allow me, by the way, whoever noticed this, this is pretty darn clever. Now when I factor it, I get this. By the way, this is still lambda x. Ah, cool. Now, you know that automatically, Every homogeneous system of equations, absolutely guaranteed, has at least one solution, the trivial solution. We know the trivial solution is always a solution. In other words, if x were the zero vector, that is a solution. But we're looking for non-zero vectors. An eigenvector isn't the zero vector. An eigenvector is a basis vector of an eigenspace. Could be a one, usually, it's going to be a one-dimensional space, meaning there's only going to be one basis vector. So I'm looking for non-zero vectors. Well, shoot, how am I supposed to get this? Well, I know that the zero vector is always a solution to a homogeneous system. So going back to what I said earlier, this is where knowing your linear is really helpful. OK. A is n by n. Is this guaranteed to even have a solution, or could this be inconsistent? Could be. So let's suppose this is consistent. Then it means I'm either going to get a unique solution or I'm going to get a parameterized solution, which means infinitely many. Let's suppose this has a unique solution. Then there's a whole set of things we call the equivalent conditions. If this has a unique solution, then the only solution to this is the zero vector. But that's only true if the determinant of A is not zero, which is only true if A has n linearly independent rows and n linearly independent columns, which also means A is row reducible to the identity matrix, which also means A can be written as a product of elementary matrices. A whole bunch of things. The beautiful thing about the equivalent conditions is one is true, all are true. One is false, all are false. I need this to have a non-trivial solution. The only way that can happen is if my determinant is zero. zero. Okay, so hopefully I'm bringing back some memories. So the only way I can solve this is to say I'm going to assume that the determinant is zero. So I want the determinant of a minus lambda i, and I'm going to set that equal to zero. Now, what does the determinant of a minus lambda i look like? Well, let's, I'll do it for that problem right there. I don't want to do it in, as an abstract general case. Well, let's do it for that guy. So it'd be 4 minus lambda, negative 5, 2, negative 3 minus lambda. Everything on the diagonal, I'm going to subtract lambda. Now, is there any guarantee the solution will be a happy solution? Yes. Nope. Is there a guarantee there will be a solution? Absolutely. Because I'm just going to get a polynomial. I'm going to get a polynomial, and I'm going to set it equal to 0. I have no doubt there's a solution. Does my solution have to be a nice, happy integer value? No. Can it be an ugly, irrational number? Yeah. Can it be complex? Yes. How often would it be complex? Exactly half the time. <laughs> so you avoided that one in linear. 
the complex until you get to chapter eight, which is the complex matrices, and then you do deal with that one. But we tend to avoid complex eigenvalues. Complex eigenvectors are okay. Complex eigenvalues aren't useful to us because we can't really solve real life problems with them. So even if I have complex entries in the matrix, I can still have real eigenvalues in certain situations. That's, that's actually the king of the hill. Did anybody, did your class do complex matrices? The most important of the real matrices is the symmetric matrix. That's the one that's guaranteed to be diagonalizable. All your eigenvectors are automatically orthogonal and all that great stuff. The complex version is called the Hermitian matrix. That's considered the top of, top of the food chain. That's crazy. From the country of Hermitian. <laughs> Just in case you want to, and the Hermites, they're the ones who do it. I think that's where it comes from. Okay, so what is this? So this is gonna be what? Negative 12 minus four lambda plus three lambda plus lambda squared minus negative 10, so plus 10, and then I'm going to set it equal to zero. Does this factor nicely? Mm, yeah. <coughs> Beautiful. So lambda equals, lambda one is two, I'll call it lambda two is negative one. I do get two real eigenvalues. Now one of the crazy things is your eigenvalues are either gonna be rational or they're gonna be irrational, but what you're never gonna see is fractions. Yeah. Because the coefficient on the lambda to the highest power will always be a one. <laughs> so you can get irrational, but you're not going to get fraction. You're not going to get halves and you know thirds and things. So most of the time we reverse engineer it so the numbers are a little more friendly. I found my eigenvalues, and those eigenvalues will show up in the final solution to this problem. We don't know where quite yet. Now I have to find my eigenvectors. Now I'm ch I chose a problem that was relatively small on purpose. I need you to remember the process. The answer is not important. It's how we got to the answer that's important. So, p lambda p inverse. Nah, not quite yet, but that's that's for diagonalization. That's yeah. We don't actually need to do that to answer this question, but you're you're on the right track though. So now what we need to do is find our eigenvectors. So one at a time. Okay. So here's what we need to do. I need to take a minus lambda i for the one I just did. Multiply it by a generic two-dimensional vector and get the zero vector and then find out all the solutions. So if I did that, so my first eigenvalue, let's use the two. So what I'm actually doing is oops, sorry, a minus two times i, but I want to use a matrix to solve this. So going back to the original problem, subtract two and you'd have two negative five, two negative three. Um, in this case, I'm not using the letter Y. No, Y are functions. The Y's are functions. The X's are elements of my vector. They, they are as different as night and day. That's why I, I prefer to use the same letter here, different letter here. If I use X's and Y's here, my God, just talk about out of control, dog sleeping with cats. I mean, just, it's, it'd be crazy. So this is x1, this is x2. x1 and x2 are numbers that live in a vector, completely unrelated to the functions at the moment. Should that be negative five as well? Yeah, Did I just screw that up? Oh, yes, yeah, sorry, you are correct. Two. You are correct. Okay, and what do I want this to equal? Zero. Zero, zero. So I'm only gonna do this one time. That's not what I write. No, what do I wanna write? I wanna write two negative five, two negative five and I augment it with zeros. That's how you would solve it. So go right from here to here, but understand you're solving this. You have to have a column there. You can't solve a matrix. You can only solve a matrix equation. Mm -hmm. So I actually have to do that. Now, this makes it kind of nice. Am I gonna get a row of zeros? Yes. I'm pretty sure I'm gonna get a row of zeros. If I don't get at least one row of zeros, I did something very wrong. If you don't get a row of zeros, then that means your, all your variables are gonna equal zero, which means the zero vector was your only answer, which means you did it wrong. And I'm gonna give you an absolute mathematical statement that a lot of people don't realize and they violate. There are exactly two eigenvalues. Just for fun, choose any other number. Pick any real number you can think of. 
any real number that is not one of these two. If I put that number in here, then the only solution will be the zero vector. For every real number that exists other than those two, if I put that number in here, the only solution will be the zero vector. Why? Because you won't get a row of zeros. No matter how many row operations you do, you'll get something and then all your variables will end up being zero. That's how you know you made a mistake. Is it possible I got these signs backwards? Yeah, I'll know it when I go to this step and it doesn't work. Now, this is another reason, by the way. When people tell me, because eigenvalues are very important, I know, in physics. And I've had people say, well, you know, it's, I have an irrational eigenvalue, so I'll just approximate it. And I'll say, good luck with that. What do you mean? If I use an approximation of the eigenvalue, I'm not using the eigenvalue. And then when I go to solve this, I don't care if you're using the supercomputer UCSD, what's it going to spit out? No. The zero vector. You round off your eigenvalue, the only solution will be the zero vector. No matter how well you rounded it, <laughs> you won't get any rows canceled. So you have to use the exact eigenvalue no matter how ugly it is. It, it's the, so when you have complex eigenvalues, which are a thing, you can't round things. So I'm going to do one row operation, pretty obvious, right? Negative in the first row, the second row, I'll just put a little arrow here. So boom, 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 beautiful. That's a good thing. That means I have one non-zero row, but I still have two unknowns. Did I mess that up? I know that we were, she mentioned that it was supposed to be negative five down there, but I think that I can probably, that I can probably do is negative one. So it should be negative two at the bottom. Our eigenvalue is 2. Yeah, isn't that for the first column though? So no, no. The eigenvalue of 2 means I'm subtracting 2 from each of the main diagonal oh, entries. Yeah. Right? So that's a 2 and that's now negative 5. If I did it wrong, these would not have canceled. I would not have gotten to 0 wrong. Pretty much can guarantee you that one. Okay. <laughs> so now I'm here. So now I need to parameterize. So basically, if I read this backwards, this actually says this. Because remember, it was x1 and x2. So I need to parameterize this. Now, I don't know if you guys remember, but there was a trick. When one of your coefficients is a 1, then you automatically pick the other one to be your parameter. But neither one of them is a 1. And the one that you really don't want, you don't want fractions in your parameterizations. There's an infinite number of parameterizations that are correct. But there aren't an infinite number that are efficient. If I said, for example, let's let x2 equal t, then x1 would be what? Five halves. Five halves t. That's not wrong, but now all this stuff I have to do in the future, like diagonalization, different things, it just gets a little messier. There's a really simple trick. Do you guys remember what it was? x equals 2t. Let x2 equal 2t, then x1 will be 5t. You just pick the other coefficient. By the way, all parameterizations are legal, but not all are efficient. So now we write it like this. So we say any vector in the form uh, 5t, sorry, I was writing backwards. 5t, 2t. Do you want to choose the negative, negative x2? Would you do negative 5t or just does the negative doesn't matter? I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You, does the sign not matter? When you're could, oh, could I have made this negative to a negative five? Yeah. 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 Any multiple would have worked. You know, you, your your high school number was twenty, so you always go with twenty, and then this would have been fifty. As long as it, as long as it solves this, you're fine. Oh, okay. But it doesn't matter because any vector of this form, which is t times this form, and that's the key. You just gave me the value, John. You just gave me the value of t being negative one. Someone else could give me the value of t being 10. Somebody else could give t be 1,000. Every multiple of this vector will now, can now serve as an eigenvector. So if I said, and by the way, this is going back to linear algebra. We call it the eigenspace of lambda equals 2 is the span if you remember what that term means, the span means every conceivable linear combination. When there's one thing, that just means every conceivable multiple. Every multiple of this vector is where this, now, zero times this vector would be the zero vector. And I know a, a vector space has to have the zero vector. Every multiple of this vector is the eigenspace. 
I only need one vector from the eigenspace to serve as my eigenvector. I don't know, how about that one? I'm not choosing any constants, am I? I'm saying all of the vectors in the eigenspace were multiples of this one, so I will use this one. The author says choose values for t. No, that is incorrect. That is incorrect mathematics, because if you can choose values for t, then you can choose zero. Not that you should. No, you always pick the basis of the eigenspace. Every linear algebra book will tell you that. The DiffyQ book will say, oh, just pick what you want. No, you can't pick what you want. You don't have a choice. You have to use that one. Now, John says he used a negative one. I, could I have had negative 5, negative 2 as my eigenvector? Yes. Yeah, every multiple of this can be, but you only need one. So I always say pick the simplest. If these were opposite signs, does it really matter?